for the Association of Art Museum Curators and AMC Foundation, the leading global organization for all nonprofit art curators. On behalf of all at AMC Foundation, our partners for this series, the Art Fund, and our speakers, it is a pleasure to welcome you to this program. The AMC Foundation offices are in New York City, locations situated upon the unceded seas territory of the Lenape and Canarsie peoples and benefited from the economies of enslaved peoples and the labors of African descended captives. We owe our existence and vitality to generations from around the world, brought here or against their will, drawn here to escape persecution and some that have lived on this land for more generations than can be counted. We pay respect to their, to their communities, past and present. This acknowledgement asks us to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that bring us together today. AMC Foundation, along with our respected and valued partner in this series, the Art Fund, are dedicated to an environment in which all individuals are treated with respect and dignity at our programs, virtual and in person. Each individual, attendee, speaker, and staff member has the right to be in a professional atmosphere that prohibits discriminatory practices, including harassment and negative communications. Our full code of conduct policy for all our programs, as well as the outlets to make a direct or anonymous report of a violation is being placed in the chat feature. Art Fund and AMC Foundation are honored to produce Beyond Statements Revisited series, a follow-up to our original 2023 part webinar program. Together, the Art Fund and AMC Foundation are committed to diversity, equity, inclusion, access, and belonging as core and central values to all that we do, and believe it is important to return to our 2020 series to update, investigate, unpack, contextualize, and disseminate where the arts community is today. Featuring experts in the fields of visual arts, nonprofits, DEAIB, Beyond Statements Revisited began with our first session on June 14th and our second just last week on June 21st and concluding with this session today. If you missed the first two, you can find the recordings on our Art Curators YouTube channel. We are thankful to our attendees for making space in their schedules to join us and to our speakers for sharing their experiences and knowledge across all of the sessions. I will now hand it over to Rachel Browning, Deputy Director of Program and Policy at the Art Fund, who will be moderating this webinar and has been our most wonderful partner over many years of outreach, alignment, and advocacy, and to whom we are most grateful to know. Thank you. Rachel, to you to begin our program. Thank you, Judith. Thank you very much. Sorry, there was an issue there with my um, my video button. Um, it's really, really lovely to be here um, this afternoon and this morning. Um, thank you, everyone, for, for joining us. Um, I'm Rachel Browning, uh, Interim Director of Programme and Policy at Art Fund, and I'm joined today by a brilliant panel who uh, we're going to be hearing from over the next hour. I'm going to start the session by introducing the, the panel. I'm going to do slightly abridged versions of their um, bios, which are long and illustrious, but they're Full bios are um, available via the AMC and Beyond Statements uh, revisited landing page, so you can you can catch them there. And then I'm going to ask each of the panel to present for sort of four or five minutes on their individual research areas and the um, and the projects that their organisations have been involved in that relate to today's webinar topic to kind of bring us all up to speed and and on the same page. Um, and then we'll dive into a conversation which I know will be really really energised and. Um, um, and yeah, kind of enthusiastic. So to kick us off, um, we're going to be hearing from Dr. Errol Francis. Um, Errol is the Artistic Director and CEO of Culture And, and he also leads the New Museum School, which partners with the University of Leicester to provide studentships for people from diverse communities. Um, Errol is involved in a number of research projects and is visiting lecturer at UCL, Sotheby's Institute of Art, honorary lecturer at the University of Exeter and visiting fellow at the University of Leicester. We'll then be hearing from Dr. Deborah Cullen Morales, who's a program officer for arts and culture at the Mellon Foundation. Previously, Deborah served as executive director of the Bronx Museum of the Arts, director and chief curator of the Wallach Art Gallery at Columbia University, 
Director of Curatorial Programs at El Museo del Barrio and Curator of the Print Collection at Robert Blackburn's Printmaking Workshop. Uh, Deborah is currently co-editing the anthology a Handbook of Latinx Art for University of California Press. And finally, we'll be hearing from Dr. Susan Puisan Locke, who is an artist, uh, writer, academic. Her practice ranges across installation, moving image, sound and text. Alongside her artistic practice, she's also a professor in contemporary art and the director of the De Decolonizing Arts Institute at the University of Arts London. Currently, she's leading the AHRC project Transforming Collections and the 2020 programme. From 2015 to 2018, Susan was co-investigator on the AHRC project Black Artists and Modernism, led by Professor Sonia Boyce and UAL in partnership with Middlesex University. So those are our speakers that we're hearing from, um, from today. And um, what we thought we'd do is taking the topic of this webinar as a starting point. Um, so I will recap there. So since 2020, several new studies, surveys and analysis have been generated and published, which investigate questions around EDI within the sector and seek to help generate their ways forward for a diverse, inclusive and accessible visual arts community. And as all the speakers have been involved in projects like this, we're going to kick things off, as I said, with a short overview of the relevant work that they've been involved in and commissioned. What we'll be hearing a bit about is the kind of background and context of their projects, what the research entailed, how they set about it, key findings, recommendations, and also crucially from their perspective, where this leads next. So starting us in our discussion this afternoon slash this morning, and we're going to hear from um, Errol. Errol, over to you. Thank you very much, Rachel. Um, and hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm... I've been asked to talk about uh, some research that we conducted as myself and um, um, a colleague from a Black-led organisation called Museum X. And Culture And is a Black-led arts and heritage charity based in um, London. Um, uh, this research was commissioned for Art Fund in 2021. And, you know, the date is really important. Uh, the aftermath of the upheavals that we had in 2020 with the murder of George Floyd and the shockwaves that went round the arts and heritage sector as well as other sectors around um, diversity and inclusion. So it's really timely that um, Art Fund commissioned this re report. And um, it was all about, uh, it was called, the title it ended up being, it's about handing over power. And it was, we were asked to look at, um, curatorial diversity schemes delivered in the UK um, from uh, about 1998 to 2021. We aim to set out what should be the priorities for funders, museums and arts organisations to encourage greater cultural diversity in the curatorial workforce. Um, we did a literature review, we looked at diversity initiatives in the UK and the US as well, nice. and we did interviews and focus groups with um, uh, key practitioners in the UK um, and we did a lot of uh, uh, qualitative data collection and analysis. So I'm just going to give you some highlights. Um, this, this presentation is going to be shared and it's got links to the full report so I can only give you a taste of what was quite an extensive piece of work. So um, uh, it was very raw the findings that we got from people um, uh, a real, um, and th this is the highlights now from some of the respondents, and there was one section that we called a lot of talk, and this was because a lot of, of the interviewees conveyed a sense of frustration about the lack of progress or, um, of uh, curatorial diversity in the UK and how much their talk there was about it. So, to quote one person, there's been a lot of focus on language, and I understand why that is, but there doesn't seem to be much of a focus on action and incentivized action or on learning from our mistakes. And I think from incentivized action, they were hinted at the sort of, um, uh, if you like, sticks and carrots that can be put in place by funders, whether they are independent funders or, go or, or government um, organizations. And so people were calling for funders to do more strategic investment in longer term programs that are research and evidence in terms of what works in museums and other sectors in the UK and internationally. Um, another uh, um, highlight from the respondents was the 
difference between regional um, uh, issues around diversity within the sector. And so one person noted that the context that they work in is very different. There are no curatorial departments. This is a small museum like you have in larger organizations. And there are very few professional curators. So it's much easier to disrupt. So they were talking about the sort of opportunities that there might be in the smaller organization. And because organizations are smaller, that kind of multifaceted role is more regular. And the idea that you have um, somebody who focuses only on collections is a bit of a nonsense because you have to be able to do fundraising as well. So that was really interesting in um, looking at the difference between the big national museums, for example, and uh, what might be possible in small regional um, organisations. Um, so I'm going to jump now to um, recommendations. We had quite a number of those, um, and I'm just going to share a few to, for you. Um, so uh, one of the big ones was to fund, increase and share high quality research on career pathways of participants in arts and heritage diversity schemes with appropriately funded longitudinal studies. This was because of not knowing enough about those schemes which did exist and what has happened to the people on them. Um, the other recommendation for funders to actively work with institutions, ensuring accountability, recognizing the burden of people of color and provide appropriate modes of support for those people. Um, uh, then uh, another uh, recommendation to pull out is to support a focus on specific initiatives leading to permanent curatorial employment rather than generic entry level or temporary roles. This is probably the biggest you know, critique actually to come out of the studies that most of the ones that we looked at, very few of them led to permanent employment. They were sort of short term taster schemes for the uh, person on the on the on the uh, placement and also for the organisation in, sen in the sense that those schemes were not sustained. So this one it was really important in terms of uh, the, the, these schemes need to lead to permanent um, employment. Um, Another big critique was about funding, who gets it and how much, and um, people calling for increased funding for and support to culturally diverse and Black-led spaces, collectives, organisations and initiatives. So this was relating to the fact that we're here in the UK, when we looked at all, most of the schemes, they were big organisations getting big funding to deliver these programmes, but actually Black-led spaces, smaller organisations, um, were not, and we highlighted some of those organisations, were not ac ac accessing similar resources to do schemes which we think would have been actually more sustainable. And then um, th this, the, the last one I want to, to quote to you really was a learning that we got from the US with some of the uh, examples that we saw of collaborations between funders, cultural organisations and academic bodies to deliver um, diversity schemes. And so we made a recommendation there for to be similar uh, consortia and partnerships in, in the UK. Um, so given that I only had a few minutes, that's as much as I think I can pack in. There is, as I said, the, the presentation is going to be circulated to you with links um, uh, uh, to the full report and also some resources that uh, I've got at the end of this um, and very much speaking actually to this, the organisations that we thought uh, should have been involved in these schemes, should be involved in these schemes and getting more support. So we've got a whole list of uh, Black-led uh, curatorial um, groups and initiatives in, in the UK at, uh, at the end of my presentation that um, I'm sure uh, Judith and her colleagues will share with you. But thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Errol. Thank you for whipping through that in such <laughs> lightning speed. And I know we'll get to um, dive into some of those recommendations, I think, in a bit more depth um, as we kind of as the as we unpack this conversation. But um, but next, I'd um, really, really like to um, ask Deborah to um, to sort of yeah to, to join us and talk a little bit about the work that she's been involved in. Thank you so much, Rachel, um, and greetings, everyone. Um, thank you, Errol. It's a pleasure to follow your presentation um, with something. Um, very much related that um, the Mellon Foundation um, has been has been partnering with Is Ithaca SNR here in the United States, um, it, the Association of Art Museums, um, and the um, and AMD, the Art Museum Directors, to conduct the 
we've just conducted our third art museum dem staff demographic survey in 2022. We released those findings in November and I'm sure the link will be circulated to you as well. Um, this 2022 survey builds on and compares demographic data that we compiled from 2015 and 2018. So this is the third um, demographic survey of museums. Um, and I want to just state that the Mellon Foundation has an enduring commitment to monitoring the demographics, continuing to monitor them um, at, at three-year intervals. We're a bit off because of the pandemic this year, but basically three-year intervals um, to track demographic change in our art museums and, and share the information broadly with the public and the art museum field specifically. Um, I want to, it's a 46 page uh, survey and I hope you'll dig in to all the charts and graphs there um, yourself, but I want to make just a few high level um, observations of the findings from this year, um, which is comparative to the previous years, of course. Um, one notable finding um, from our 2022 survey is that um, women hold the majority of museum leadership positions across all museum sizes and types and women's numbers have grown significantly uh, from, from when we began tracking this, this, um, these demographics. Um, it's a question for closer analysis as to whether women manage the same budget size organizations as men, but the fact that the fact that they're now um, in the majority is, is, is interesting to us to track and mark that change. We also in this 2022 cycle for the first time um, began uh, tracking non-binary leadership, which um, is less than 1% currently reported. Um, I want to intersect that with some key findings on race, race and ethnicity. Um, the field is growing more diverse steadily and slowly. Um, the report looks broadly, um, it, it digs very deeply into the um, US census categories, um, but for my overview remarks, I'm going to just track um, people of color, forgive my use of this constructed term, uh, versus white, white people. Um, people of color, according to the US census survey, um, include American Indian, Alaskan Native, Asian, Black, Hispanic, Middle Eastern, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander, or people who identify as two or more races. Um, and so we're tra we track each of those areas, but to, to broadly look at it, we see an increase in the areas um, where we're seeing increases are in the overall museum staff. We see 27% 27 of people identified as people of color in 2015, in the overall museum staff and in 2022, it was up to 36%. Um, more importantly, 27% now currently of all what we classify as intellectual leadership positions in museums, which includes museum leadership, curators, conservators, and educators um, is, is now up to 27% people of color, um, which is an increase from 18% when the survey began. However, this, goes without saying that the more important that the important roles in the museums are still overwhelmingly held by white staff. And so while there have been slow and steady gains that we're we're happy to be tracking, um, still only 20% of museum leadership and only 20% of conservation staff are not white. So it's encouraging, but still there's a lot of work to do. Um, if you drill down into the report, some somewhat exciting findings for us were that 35% of the conservators hired in 2021 and 2022 were reported as not white compared to 18% who were hired prior to 2021. So there's been a, a market increase since as Errol noted, um, 2020, um, the murder of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery and others. And we are seeing um, some activity now surrounding more active hiring of non-white museum staff. So this is, this is all good news, slow and steady, but still we have a lot of work to do in the museum field. Um, I want to also mention, if I may with my, with my few moments here, because I know our colleague um, Mia Locks was not able to, to be on the, the Zoom. So my esteemed colleague Mia Locks, who's the co-director and co-founder of Museum Moving Forward, um, which Mellon also funds and supports, has also conducted a data survey on workplace equity and organizational culture in US museums. And those findings are not yet available 
um, but they will come out soon and we are waiting to, to hear about them. We have some preliminary findings that are on their website at museumsmovingforward.com. Um, and this is, I think, a yin and yang situation where we're talking about the demographics on one side and the internal workplace, um, workplace equity and organizational culture on the other side. Um, that while our survey, the demographic survey is reported by an institutions, either HR departments or uh, directorship level reports for all their staff. The museum's moving forward survey is, uh, is surveying individuals, the individuals who are working in museums, including directors. So um, directors, but also staff. And that's very, very important to have their, um, their data um, as they report it themselves. So we're waiting for that eagerly and we would look forward to them speaking about it also. Um, I think those are my high level, high level comments on our Mellon demographic survey. Um, it's just one of an expanding number of efforts to gather data on diversity and work workforce conditions in the museum field. Um, well, I know we're focused here on the United States, but it's really great to be in conversation with um, an, an, international, an international conversation. And I know everyone feels surveyed out, but I want to just say it's really important to get this data and to consider how we might um, interpolate it together. So I think those are my remarks and I'll turn it back over to you, Rachel. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Um, so what we're going to do, we're going to slightly tweak the um, just the order of things here, just because Susan is having some technical difficulties. So we're going to come to her presentation, um, come to her presentation in a few minutes. So Deborah and Errol, if you wouldn't mind just um, popping back on screen, I'm going to throw a question your way, um, and then as I said, what we'll do is we'll 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 hear from Susan in just a minute. Um, so. One of the things I was sort of thinking about in, in terms of, um, yeah, thinking about kind of ethnographic and, and sort of um, um, data surveys when it comes to, um, yeah, when it comes to the makeup of um, museum workforce and um, how we kind of, how we get this information, I suppose, um, to, to have it uh, to have it ready at our fingertips, is that there are certain, I guess, some limits in terms of these surveys and, and analyses. And I wondered if there was a more kind of radical or risky approach um, that could make the data easier to extrapolate, understand and action. But following on from that, just thinking about what the space is between ethical research methodologies and outputs, uh, and also those that can really, really help shift the dial. So I suppose what I'm asking you just to sort of comment on is around the kind of ethics of this sort of work and how you can really cut to the chase in a way that's effective but also ethically ethical. Um, Errol, you're 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 sort of kind of nodding along there, so I will <laughs> throw sort of this to you first. Yeah, I think it's a very interesting question actually, and I, I think. I suppose behind it is that um, uh, or, uh, ethical dimensions of research methodology can obscure things that we need to bring out. Um, and the, actually, thinking of uh, two um, examples, actually, of, I think uh, different, one of them that probably isn't called research, but I think should be credited with that. And it, it, it was, um, um, a lot of people might remember this, this was, uh, I think, two years ago, a booklet started circ circulating called Barbican Stories. And um, it was about um, uh, racism within an arts organisation in London. And um, there were quotes from existing staff in it, on past staff in it. And they even went back to the building of the, Art Centre itself, who built the building and the the, um, the, the racism involved in the, the building of the, the, the Arts Centre. Um, I think it had quite an impact in the sense that it, it was a piece of kind of guerrilla re research, if you like, that um, outed things that were going on in, in an organisation. Um, and uh, I, I, so... <laughs> That's the kind of research from below, as it were, you know, the sort of guerrilla action it, that does call into question the sort of methodologies and um, the kind of exposure that we need, really. Um, so the truth of what happens to people in these workforces that could be, you know, brought out into the open. But a more, um, shall we say, um, <laughs> establishment or safer example of a, of a similar thing, and 
I'm not going. I'm not able to name the organisation. But we, I was involved in a, a project called um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in another museum, and also in London. And in a way, actually, it followed a similar thing, actually, to um, Barbican Stories. But this time round, the organisation knew it was happening. They had actually called in, the, and and we got these um, stories from uh, diverse people, people of colour. Um, um, um in in the organization and the, the organization signed up from the beginning to look at something called embedded whiteness which was itself quite challenging um and um yeah i think it 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 wasn't that it was unethical it just didn't follow this the, the normal pattern of how you'd get evidence for that kind of research you know we had the cleaners there were the front of house people uh, right up to uh, people working in acute curatorial who were able to say what they wanted to say anonymously. Um, and I can say that it has had a, an impact. I mean, it's an ongoing piece of work with this organisation. And at first they were really, really shocked by it, by the findings. But I think that they've come to terms with it and they're really addressing it and they're trying to change. But I think it, it, we needed that kind of raw, literally raw, evidence to make them realize how serious the situation was right thank you deborah over to you yeah i i'd love to pick up on on um something that errol just said um the 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 types of the types of data that's being collected i mean our the the melon demographic survey is is you know like a, a census right it's like accounting which is really important to to, to count and to track but me, um, as the first time overseeing this survey, um, I started working for, for Mellon during the pandemic, so it's the first time I've overseen a survey of this sort, and um, and working and collaborating with Ithaca SNR, I learned a lot, um, but I, I'm sure I drove everyone insane because I questioned everything, because we cannot assume that um, even though we're just, you know, collecting, you know, count, counting, right, um, that's we, we can't assume that there's neutrality even in that. And so the very first thing that I questioned was like, what's who who are we counting from? Like, what was the pool that we're getting? And interestingly, um, in the United States, there is no sort of master list of all the museums. Um, so the the survey always um, you know relied on our wonderful collaborating partners, AAM and AMD here in the United States. Um, but I myself personally worked for institutions that had spotty records of membership to those institutions because there's a financial component to it. Um, and so for limited resources, I always worked for, you know, relatively modest organizations. Um, and we didn't necessarily um, always belong. So we wouldn't have been counted sometimes. Um, so I, I'm, I'm really grateful for collaboration of um, the Association of African American Museums, um, the Association of Art Museum Curators hosting us today, um, the Center for Curatorial Leadership and others for sharing their mailing lists with me um, as we try to reach out to a broader pool this time of, of you know, of, of what, is, what is considered a museum, an official museum, right? Um, so that's, that's one thing. Um, also, a question that I've been asking us internally, and I pose to the field, you know, what are, so we're counting, and what are we, what are we, what are we looking for? Like, what is the result? When, what will we ever say, we're done, we're finished, this is great? Or like, are we matching demographics in the US or in the particular localities as a baseline? Like where, you know, what, what, what is, what do we hope for? What is our goal? Certainly, certainly more more richly varied um, participation in the in the art museum field than we have currently, but 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 to, to what, right? So we're asking these questions too. I don't have a good answer yet to that, but certainly as a baseline, as a minimum, you know, at least matching, if not exceeding, the demographics of of the nation, um, which which is ever changing, right? Um, and then on the other side of it, and again, I, I, I can't represent museums moving forward, but I know a bit about the work they're doing. Um, and there's a there's an overview on their website that's really fascinating that I hope for 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 folks to to download and read before the findings come out. They're asking individuals to to share their experiences as as Errol spoke. So while we're doing like a count, um, they're asking for you know more more qualitative rather than quantitative data, and that has to be safeguarded, anonymized, and kept with the highest, highest of standards, which makes things slow, tricky, um, you know, 
Um, but but super important because some of the findings that they're coming out with are, you know, are going to be quite revelatory about workplace harassment, discrimination, um, et cetera. And we need to we need to understand this. This needs to be revealed um, and and addressed and then addressed. So um, so so the ethics, you know, are, are, are important, but we have we have to always question how we're doing it. What are our tools? Um, who, who who created those tools? Who are we even asking? Where are we getting the information from? All those, all those considerations. Great, thank you. And uh, and um, Errol, I'm just going to just very quickly ask you to reflect on that that um, comment that Deborah made about that kind of qualitative data and and the um, and I know that the difficulty and the, the challenge that you and Sandra sort of faced when you were kind of pulling that together for for yeah. for the yeah. um, for it's about handing over power. Yeah. Um, yeah, it'd be really great just to hear. I suppose also maybe sort of six or eight months out from that project, yeah. reflecting back on that experience. Um, yeah. yeah, if you'd like to share share with the audience. Yeah, I think that the qualitative aspect of it was almost more important than the counting of numbers actually in order to get across the lived experience aspect of of, of um you know how, how people are experiencing marginaliz marginalization if you if you like and um i mean i mentioned um we, we, a couple of us you know um deborah's mentioned george floyd as well i think that I think one of the things that's happened since 2020 actually is that the, um, uh, if you like, the emotional um, consequences or experiences of racism have become easier to talk about. Um, and so lived experience or people, I mean, there was one reference there to, uh, you know, somebody saying the emotional um, impact of being made to do diverse you know that the price of getting a job you know curatorial is that you then have to do it right and solve the problem and 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 the the, the burden that that poses um so i think that qualitative research is is a good way to bring that out i think that, you know the, the i mean i keep using this word um raw but i mean i have to say that that is the big shift for me since 2020 there's something about um i think it's um the philosopher agamben who talks about raw life you know that be, that that's the big thing that before uh 2020 i don't think that we were so connected with the rawness of um racism uh, both for individuals but also in an art museum or a heritage context how one actually comes back into contact with that in terms of collections and working with collections. Um, so, um, yeah, qualitative research is a way to, great way to capture that, uh, which numbers cannot, I don't think, very yeah. well. Yeah. Brilliant, thank you both. So I know that Susan is 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 in the starting blocks to, to talk to us. So I'm gonna, um, hi Susan, hello. Um, yeah, um, so hopefully, all the tech gremlins have been solved and you are, um, yeah, you're prepped to sort of give us a presentation. Thank you very much. And then we'll bring everyone together in a honor. Hey, just bear with me. Thank you. Thank you so much um, to AMC and uh, Art Fund for the collaboration invitation and opportunity to share some uh, thoughts and projects um, and to participate in this conversation. Um, thanks to everyone for your patience just now too. Um, the projects, uh, like the conversations, are very much live and very, very close. So I've pulled together some no uh, notes somewhat on the go. They may be a little bit uneven, slightly breathless uh, between uh, current travels, but hopefully will offer a sense of um, what we're doing and, and where we are now. Um, there's a few slides there that uh, point to the Black Artists and Modernism Project that uh, Rachel um, referred to earlier, um, led by Sonia Boyce, on which uh, I was one of the co-investigators um, and flagging there just a couple of the projects that um, or, or outputs that um, emerged from that three year project, uh, an exhibition called Speech Acts, which featured over 70 works by over 40 artists from across four collections. And that was at Manchester Art Gallery um, for 11 months, coinciding um, the opening, I think, coincided with the uh, broadcast of a, a landmark BBC documentary 
Documentary Commission, uh, who ever heard of a black artist. Um, there were conferences and e-publications, a special issue of art history and all of those links uh, I'll provide um, for the channel after this event. There are many more slides here than I can speak to, but I just wanted to give a sense of um, context in terms of how the uh, Decolonizing Arts Institute as a, as a project emerged very much out of and follow, followed on from um, the Black Artists and Modernism project, recognizing uh, not only that project, but, but previous initiatives um, from across UAL and beyond. So I was brought uh, on board, I was invited to, to develop the Institute um, after BAM. Um, and I'm flagging there uh, just some of the development and pilot activities over the first three years of the Institute, which of course uh, coincided with uh, the COVID pandemic. Um, so many of these events uh, took place um, online, but I wanted to point to these to acknowledge the, the time and um, uh, uh, space needed to develop and, and continue conversations that both preceded and, and started with the Black Artists and Modernism Project. So um, I'm not sure quite what time I started. I know I didn't have much time. So I'm going to um, uh, take us very quickly um, through the Transforming Collections and 2020 projects, um, which uh, uh, Rachel um, mentioned before. And uh, this is one of the projects doing the work, um, the a museum workshop series that um, was led by uh, uh, Dr. Angeli Delal Clayton, who was also involved in the uh, BAM project uh, with Dr. Ilaria Purini. Uh, Puri from the uh, Contemporary Arts Society um, through 2021. Um, so transforming collections and 2020, there's, you can see in the slide, a kind of outline um, summary of, of what those projects are, but um, to speak very briefly to transforming collections um, first, it's one of five uh, major three-year projects that form part of the AHRC five-year program called Towards a National Collection. Um, and one might very well question all the terms that make up the, the program title. Um, for us in Transforming Collections, we're working very closely um, within UAL um, with our colleagues over at the Creative Computing Institute, and, and also closely with Tate as our main project partner, as well as um, 15 others, um, I think 15 or 16 um, partners and collaborating organizations in total. So they represent a wide range of UK public art collections, um, archives and charities of different scales, as well as an international partner, the Van Alba Museum in Eindhoven. And the aims with this project, um, if you uh, could move on to the next slide, um, uh, jump over a few slides there. Um, the aims are to enable cross search of collection, uh, collections in plurals to, 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 to surface patterns of bias and to uncover uh, hidden connections, as well as to open up new interpretive frames and uh, potential histories after Zule um, of art, nation and heritage. Um, I won't uh, decode, hopefully some of this is, is um, fairly evident in terms of the, the structuring of the project. We can dive into some of the detail um, if there's time. Um, but there are essentially uh, five entwined, entwined um, strands combining critical art, historical, museological and participatory machine learning development. Um, the project's underlying questions are uh, whose heritage, whose voices, bodies and experiences are centred and privileged within collections? How can the architectures, algorithms and relations of oppression that structure and define collections narratives be surfaced and potentially transformed? And what could an equitable, inclusive, distributed yet connected and evolving so-called national collection look like? Um, the next few slides uh, point to some of the activities so far. We are just over the halfway point of the three year project. So if we go past the research questions, um, these images um, point to some of the workshops that have taken place with Tate, a recent conference at the Van Alba Museum, um, uh, which took place in April. Um, 
I'm going to jump, I think, uh, forward to 2020. I'm, I'm mindful of time. Um, so uh, you'll have access to these slides or a version of these slides um, after this event. Um, so moving on then to 2020, it's a, a project unfolding in parallel um, with Transforming Collections. So where Transforming Collections is funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council, 2020 is supported by um, generous funding from the Freelance Foundation and uh, Arts Council England, as well as um, uh, uh, funding from UAL. It's a three-year national commissioning and network uh, program designed to catalyze artists' careers and change in collections. Um, and it was conceived at the height of the resurgent Black Lives Matter movement in June 2020 as a response to urgent calls for meaningful actions to follow numerous gestures, statements being made at the time. Um, it comes in part out of um, my own experience as an artist working with various institutions, my experiences of and with collections and archives, um, with commissioning and residency programs. Um, and it's also inspired by a number of prior and, and concurrent initiatives, including uh, Future Collect, um, which you have heard um, Sapake and Angiyama speak on um, in an earlier Beyond Statements um, uh, discussion, uh, the Government Art Collections 1010 program, as well as the East Contemporary Visual Arts Network's um, New Geographies program. Um, so I think it's important to, to acknowledge the, the, the initiatives and models that, um, that uh, exist around concurrently or proceed. Um, the project launched in autumn 2021, um, and the aims are, if we could skip forward a few slides, um, the aims of 2020 are to uh, diversify representation within and cross collections and to connect and build resilience between artists and collections through uh, networks um, of support. Um, we want to inspire uh, support inclusive engagement between artists, collections and audiences to address the often problematic ways in which diverse communities um, are, are reflected in museums and galleries, to urge critical reflection and change in collection policies and practices, um, and to generate a uh, richer understanding um, both of collection histories and the contributions of underrepresented or overlooked artists in their midst. Um, I'm going to wrap up. Um, in fact, I might wrap up right now. Um, if you could zip through the remaining slides um, with some introductory visuals, really, to, to foreground the artists that we're working with. We've just recently um, announced the second cohort of artists. So we have our 2020 artists that we're now in the middle of um, uh, visiting the collections partners um, with. Um, and I think the final slide, um, if we uh, zip through those quickly, uh, brings us back to uh, doing the work and to the, the report um, commissioned um, titled Handing Over Power. Um, and again, I just want to acknowledge that the development of partnerships go back to the Black, Art and Black Artists and Modernism Project to earlier research. Um, um, and sector initiatives that go back at least 20 years. Um, the complementarity between projects within the Institute, but also with these um, precedents, um, and to underline uh, the kind of uh, fundamental um, commitment or objective to nurturing peer networks um, as part of uh, these uh, current activities. Um, I'm going to stop there. Um, I'm sure I've taken up way too much time. Um, so I am going to mute myself. Thank you, Susan. Uh, you've managed to cram a lot in there. I know there's lots of information online about these projects as well, and we'll be sharing links um, links after the session. So if anyone wants to sort of dive in and find out a bit more, um, then um, yeah, there's, there's lots of information available. Susan, I was just going to ask you, um, and maybe sort of as you answer this, um, our other sort of panelists can, can rejoin. But um, so just from, for some reflections on you about how new technologies and automated research tools and computer science can help the field of data inquiry specifically when it comes to EDI? 
Um, I think, thank you for the question, Rachel. Um, I think I, I want to first, I want to underline a couple of things that um, both uh, Deborah and, and Errol underlined um, or foregrounded, uh, the, the focus on the qualitative and the need to question um, you know, what are the questions being asked? Who are they being asked of? Um, how are they being um, asked? What are the tools? Um, and and also in in contrast to the ways in which um, uh, general thinking and perceptions may be formulating around um, uh, AI machine learning within the tank project, um, we are. Uh, engaging, or rather our colleagues across the Creative Computing um, Institute are very much working with a, a, a form of machine learning called interactive machine learning, um, which is focused on working with small uh, data sets, going deep, doing close work, um, not with not working with big data, um, in order to, to focus on the qualitative, in order not to generalize, not to seek to universalize universalized and certainly not to be seeking solutions to um, what might be articulated as problems with um, collection. So it's thinking about how to use interactive machine learning to help us to keep asking questions and to and to interrogate the kinds of questions we ask too. Um, so not about accelerating or scaling up, but slowing right down and thinking about how machine learning can help us to embed in our practices a kind of critical function. Um, if there's anything to be automated, one might say it's it's criticality itself, valves or, or filters that um, instill and, and, and normativize the necessary reflexivity um, in as we move through, um, navigate, um, uh, encounter or, or counter, seek to counter collections. Um, just to point to a question that the, the artist and academic um, Stephanie Dinkins, who gave a um, keynote at the conference at Van Arbor recently, um, uh, she raised the question or, through her work, what does AI need from us? Um, which I think is a really interesting formulation that foregrounds um, uh, a need for us to uh, contemplate our agency and how we shape and train. You know, AI, AI is shaped and trained by humans. Who are the humans um, doing that work? Who are the humans not in the space of doing that work? Um, what are the um, uh, perspectives, knowledges, biases that the AI is being trained with, and how do we, what do we have to do to to um, to to counter those? That's a that's a, a great way to sort of yeah to address that or to think about it, a, a, approaching it from from that other angle, as you say. Um, Errol and Deborah, do you want to join back? Um, join us back in the room. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Great. Um, so we're all together. Um, um, we had some um, really, really great questions um, that were fielded in advance. Um, and I would encourage anyone who's got a question specifically they would like to answer. Uh, sorry, it's sort of put to the to put to the panel to do so um, in the in the function. But we did have some really good questions that were fielded in advance. That I think do relate quite specifically to some of the topics that we've been discussing today. Um, and so I'm going to if we've got time, sort of go through some of those. Um, Errol, um, reflecting back, I suppose, also on, on some of the, the recommendations, and it's about handing over power. Um, we had a question sort of related to further education um, that was fielded in, in advance. I'm going to um, sort of put through this quite quickly um, and maybe then get your, your reflections on it. And then, yeah, Susan and Deborah, I'd also love, obviously, you to, to sort of um, chime in your thoughts here. So the question is, for many aspiring art historians and curators of colour, graduate school is a traumatic experience where racism mm. in the academy, unsupported faculty and the financial costs incurred by participating mm. in the programme attempt mm. to gatekeep them out of the field. Mm. How can museums move away from the necessity of graduate degrees as a qualification and or how can we advocate for a more equitable graduate school experience for BIPOC? Errol, do you want to start yeah. us off? <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you that both on, um, <clears throat> excuse me, on a personal level <clears throat> and in my day-to-day -day job, I really concur with what is being said there because I mean, I never, I nearly didn't finish my MA, not because of anything that was happening to me, but the things that the institution was doing to me 
And if it hasn't been for the support of some amazing friends on the course, um, I, I wouldn't have actually finished it, you know. And I, uh, so I, I, I totally get that thing of the trauma associated with being in certain higher education, especially some elite uh, colleges and universities that we have. Um, uh, and I also can concur with the, um, and this has been noting in a number of reports, the, you know, um, qualification inflation <clears throat> that exists when the arts and heritage sector, people are asking for postgraduate qualifications for roles that don't really need it, right? Now, I think that we can address both of those in a way in the same, um, you know, space, you know, in the sense that, um, so at Culture and the, the, what the new museum school does is to try to create that pathway for people who want to take um, postgraduate education and make sure that they're supported. So we've got 30 students on, um, um, and we're, we're soon to recruit our 45th student on the postgraduate program at the University of Leicester. And we, we you know, there's a whole program of support because, you know, those of us who are managing the program have the lived experience we know what those students could face we try to make sure that they don't have those experiences or if they do that they get the appropriate level of support and advocacy from us right and at the same time you can say well you challenge the sector about qualification inflation you know i think the two things can be held together because it is really empowering actually um to have access to education um for people who want to take it you know it's really really empowering and we've seen people grow you know in the courses that, that we have provided and grow in confidence and um and it's helped their careers you know but um on the other hand we've got to call out the kind of institutional racism that people experience and make sure that it's tackled yeah, but do you want to reflect on, on that? Because I know this sort of qualification inflation is a very pertinent issue in, in, in the US. Yes, 100%. Um, I, I also um, echo everything Errol just said, um, that it, it's, 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 it's two parts. Um, but we, we at Mellon, for example, um, I will say in the past um, have been have been guilty of um, also, you know, expecting or insisting on you know, PhDs for things. Um, and we're 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 open to um, prior grantees, you know, adjusting those qualifications and in fact, happy to happy to work with them to do that um, as it makes for more equitable hiring practices um, and, and consideration of lived experience as well. Um, and I'm heartened by some projects that I see in the field, like, for example, here in the United States, one that I'll just point to, um, ASU, Arizona, sorry, I'm using acronym soup, which I hate, um, um, Arizona State University and um, Los Angeles County Museum of Art, ASU LACMA, have partnered on a program um, where they are uh, supporting um, graduate level master's degrees, I believe, for people who are actually working in their institutions. Who, who, who profess, you know, wanting to stay and wanting to advance within. And so they're supporting um, people doing that work um, while they're working, which I think is, is, is another like sort of fantastic um, and innovative idea. So I think there's, there's a lot more that we could do and, and we, we are considering it, but uh, considering how we can be helpful in those regards. Right. And, and Susan, obviously you work within a, a university higher education context. So yeah, what, what are your thoughts on this on this question? Well, it's um it's interesting that it, it kind of makes me reflect on the the fact that my my own experience was quite um I was an exception, I suppose. I was fortunate in and I think so much of um it's not unusual to make your way through somehow this space thanks to um, an individual here or there um, facilitating an opportunity. But I know that that um, experience is exceptional. It's not me that's exceptional. It's the, it's the conditions. It's um, the, having the fortune to encounter certain people along the way um, and to recognise in hindsight how, how unusual um, that, that is often. Um, and, and that's the problem, that it's, an, it's uncommon. Um, even now, um, in the context of UAL, you know, there's a, a, a clear um, imbalance in terms of the um, staff 
workforce representation and and student um, uh, representation. Um, I don't. I, I think I can only um, uh, agree with the observations made, and I don't know what the um, solutions are because it's not just about representation um, and and numbers. Um, it's the it's the knowledge with a capital K that uh, goes uncontested. It's the curriculum um, that, um, despite talk from various corners, and I'm not just talking about the spaces that um, I've worked in, but um, it's the failure to fundamentally uh, shake up um, and and think about what decentering, um, decolonizing the curriculum um, actually looks like. Um, could look like um, that. We can say that you know, the workaround um, or in this space um, has been with us you know, at, at least you know, 10 years. And yet the, the incursions, the increments are, um, in terms of change are, are incredibly slow. Um, it's uh, I'm 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 still um, slightly uh, surprised to be in the space that I am that I'm in, um, and to be and grateful to be able to hold this space for the moment of the Decolonizing Arts Institute, um, and excited for what that might become if if I and those with whom I work are able to um, build the support around us, build out our networks and and hold each other in order to be able to invite others trying to avoid saying in because there is you know there shouldn't be a kind of in and out but across um so yeah I'm rambling now so I'll, I'll stop and not at all I was going to try and squeeze in one more question um that we've had in advance um let me see if I can do this. So I'm going to just ask the kind of um, the kind of second bit of it, and and this is going on from your point on kind of um, curriculum thinking about collections. I think because the two are kind of linked in a kind of pedagogical kind of sense. So so how can we reinterpret and reprogram the collections we already have, so European art, decorative art, American landscapes, in order to make them more relevant to diverse audiences? So this is a question I think that's about maybe not just buying more, but doing more with what institutions already have. Um, Susan, could you answer that in 15 seconds? And then I'm gonna okay. ask Deborah we to sum up. <laughs> okay, uh, we need to critically interrogate all the narratives uh, that that uh, uh, that what's the word? I want to say stick to them. The sticky and the unsticky narratives. Um, how the collections came to be. Who were the collectors, donors, patrons? Who gifted, made requests? What 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 else enabled those collections to come into being? And what are the terms and conditions that hold them in those places? What other categorizations, classifications, the hierarchies of value, the notions? the valuing of notions of provenance, authenticity, um, and to go back to you know, questions that, that, that Deborah raised, you know, from what perspectives, from whose perspectives um, are we seeing and encountering and experiencing um, these collections? So conversely, whose voices and bodies and presences are we not seeing, hearing or feeling? Was that 15 seconds? Well, probably a bit more, so we might have to stop there, I'm afraid. I'm really sorry. I don't want to go past sort of 501. Um, so I'm going to wrap this up. Um, we could have stayed online for another another hour, I think, quite easily. But yeah, I just want to say a huge thank you to, to our brilliant speakers today, um, Errol, Deborah, Susan, for your time. And as promised, a very, a very energizing and illuminating conversation. Um, I'd also really like to express my, my sincere and warm thanks to our, our dear partners at AAMC and the brilliant team there um, for managing these sessions. And of course, for everyone in the audience for engaging so enthusiastically. If you haven't yet, do catch up with the previous two sessions, um, webinars and the Beyond Statements Revisited series. They're on AMC's YouTube uh, page. And uh, yeah, just to say it's been an absolute pleasure, um, as ever, to collaborate with AMC, to hear from all our speakers. And um, hopefully we'll see you all again 